Hey, okay, this is Mrs. Murdoch, and I'm going to go over monohybrid versus dihybrid crosses. So first of all, a monohybrid cross, and we are adhering to Mendelian genetic laws here, is the simple one that you learned as freshmen. That means you are crossing a s genes for a single trait, and each trait is represented by two alleles, right? So it would be, for example, if you had two parents and they were both hybrids, you have a monohybrid cross. So that's very simple. So you do a Punnett square with four boxes and you're following the laws of segregation. Each parent goes across the top and the side, that's the way I do it and you separate the alleles for one parent here and for the other parent there. And then when you fill in the boxes, you get this genotypic outcome. And then if you were doing the phenotypic outcome, phenotypic outcome, it would be three uh, dominant to one recessive individual, right? Because three dominants are, are showing and one recessive is showing. And I'm kind of doing this quickly because I think that's not the hard part here, okay? So I'm gonna go down and now we're gonna talk about a dihybrid cross. So with the dihybrid cross, I need a lot of space here. dihybrid cross, now you're crossing two different traits with two alleles each, and both parents are heterozygous for both traits. So what that looks like, I'm just using A's and B's here to keep it simple. That looks like this. Here's one parent that is a dihybrid for those traits, times the other parent that is a dihybrid for those traits. So if we're following Mendelian law here and we're going through segregation and independent assortment for these letters, you're gonna have a, lot, a much bigger Punnett square to deal with here. So the Punnett square in this case is going to be 16 boxes instead of just four because you're handling the segregation and independent assortment of two sets of alleles instead of just one set of alleles. Because we're looking at two traits and how they can assort in individual offspring rather than just one. So now the question is the gametes that go across the top here and down the sides here, right? The diploid number of the parent is four. So the haploid number of the gametes is gonna be two. So each gamete is gonna have two letters. But now we have to show the independent assortment that you were showing me the other day with your chromosomes. And you guys remember your algebra a little bit? Remember FOIL? First, outside, inside, last? You can use it here to show the different pairings that you can make with these four letters. So first, there is one gamete that could come from this parent outside. There's another gamete that comes from that parent inside. There's the next gamete. And the last possible gamete is gonna be two recessive letters, right? That's how you do that. Down the side, since the parents are the same, these gametes over here are also gonna be exactly the same. This is a classic dihybrid cross. Not all crosses have exactly these letters. Not all crosses that, that cross two traits are called dihybrid. They're only called dihybrid when both parents are heterozygous for both traits. You see. It's not always true. Uh, for some crosses, maybe, maybe this parent will be all dominant letters and maybe this parent would be all recessive. Then it's not a dihybrid cross. It's just a two trait cross that you have to figure out, right? But to do this, then what you do, when you're filling in boxes, do yourself the favor of always putting the capital letters before the lowercase. In this case, it doesn't matter, they're all capital, and keep the letters for each trait together. They're easier to interpret later if you do that, right? 
So if I go down here, I'm keeping my A's in front of my B's, and then I'm keeping my lowercase second, not first, right? There, right? And if you fill all of those in, so each possible offspring has the renewed diploid number, right? Um, and if you fill all of those in, do you want me to fill them in? <laughs> I was like, ah. okay. Um, so, yeah. Oh, geez. No, now I'm going to start messing up because I haven't had my coffee. <laughs> there we go. Okay. If you did fill all of those in, um, since this is a classic uh, dihybrid cross, there's already a phenotypic outcome that you may recognize. Your phenotypic outcome um, is 9, 3, 3, 1. You may remember those numbers. Maybe you remember that ratio. It's a very famous ratio. It only happens when you have a classic dihybrid cross like this one, two heterozygous, and Mendel laws being followed, all right? So both of those things have to be true for you to get this. So if you know that there's nothing funky going on like gene linkage or anything like that, and if it's a classic dihybrid cross, you don't even have to do the Punnett square. You can just assume, oh, the phenotypic ratio is this. Phenotypic is you're gonna have nine individuals that have this, both dominants, three, that have one that's, re that's recessive and the other dominant. Three that have one that where the other is recessive and the other is dominant. And one that is completely recessive. One little guy, this one right here actually, is the one where that one possible one sixteenth of an offspring is gonna have both recessive traits shown, okay? So that's how you do a, a cross with two traits. And that's how it differs from a cross with one trait. And if it's a classic dihybrid cross, this is always going to be your phenotypic outcome, meaning the physical traits will be nine of your possible babies will show both dominant traits. Three of them will show one dominant and one recessive trait. Three of them will show it the other way around and only one possible baby will show both recessive traits if that's what you're starting with, okay? All right, so I hope that's helpful and please feel free to